Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. With only a few weeks left of this year's legislative session, the House and Senate are in a final push to pass key legislation, including finalizing a state budget, dealing with the abortion issue, and how to replace a key constitutional officer. The Associated Press's Jeffrey Collins and the state's Joe Bustos join us to break it all down. Jeffrey and Joe, thanks for joining me for a legislative update. And Jeffrey, I want to start with you. Uh, you know, we're at this time of the year right now in the session where it's crossover week is coming up. The merry-go-round here in Columbia is spinning a little bit faster. Uh, the, the first year, the, the two-year session's kind of winding down here. But I want to ask you about the budget because that's the biggest thing that lawmakers do up here. The House passed their $14 billion budget a few weeks ago, then they took off a week. Uh, I want to ask you just what you saw in that budget that came out of the House that's now over in the Senate and some of the highlights that stood out to you. Once again, South Carolina has a nice big pot of money to spend and they are spreading it around. I mean, the big deal are salary increases. Pretty much every state employee is going to get a salary increase. Teachers are, they're raising the minimum pay by $2,500. Law enforcement, especially the lower paid people that do the, 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 the patrolling and things like that, they'll get a significant raise. All state employees are getting a raise. Um, you know, it, it, that's the, big pot of money, but there's plenty of other things that go around. There are $100 million for bridge repair, several hundred million dollars for other road projects. There's, uh, you know, more than $100 million to help build rural schools where the state takes money and, uh, you know, helps out school districts that don't have a big property tax base. I believe Saluda County was one of the beneficiaries last year. Um, there's a lot of economic development going around. I know we may discuss that a little later in the show. Um, the one thing that isn't in the budget that's kind of interesting is there doesn't appear to be any rebate at this moment. I mean, we'll see what the Senate does. They, they, the, the Senate Finance Committee takes up the budget next week, and but there's been no discussion of any kind of tax rebate or anything. Uh, but the income tax cut, that the graduated cut that's been going on that started last year, looks like that's on tap too. So there will be some tax cut, but it doesn't look like a rebate's on the table at the moment. And Joe, you follow the budget closely too. Um, any additional items that jumped out to you, especially when we look at uh, that debate that played out on the House floor with the House Freedom Caucus really introducing a lot of amendments, some that weren't tangential to the budget that got ruled out of order. Uh, just what stood out to you? So some other highlights of the budget uh, we've had, it was $200 million for mega site development for the Department of Commerce, $196 million for uh, Medicaid and Medicare expenses reimbursements. Uh, and something that college students are going to like, there's $69 million for for tuition rate freezes. I think that's always popular. Uh, no money for I-73. Will you continue with this request? It's still not being funded. Mm -hmm. uh, Ellen Weaver got some money for uh, uh, for K-3 literacy instruction training and some high-intensity uh, tutoring. Um, so those are some of the some of the highlights that I saw. Uh, but yeah, the, the debate slowed down on that uh, first night and even into the second day as we had lots of amendments from the Freedom Caucus talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how they're trying to get that out of colleges and universities. They are, uh, they want to spend some money, which they said goes towards those uh, those those initiatives and put it towards like SLED and DSS and the Office of Resiliency. But ultimately, uh, lawmakers decided not to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been seeing a lot from the House Freedom Caucus this year, too, in terms of, you know, it seems like every week there's a different fire to be put out or freedom to be fought. Um, have, have they made any headway? It didn't seem like anything really kind of came out of all that during that budget debate. What's the status of that? So all their amendments got, got killed or defeated. They, uh, they had some provisos to try to ban uh, mandatory uh, diversity training or making diversity part of the admissions or hiring process. Uh, those got killed. But there is a promise to actually or that there's a understanding that they will actually create actual legislation and it will go through the traditional lawmaking process through the committee process and so we'll see how long that will eventually take but they're going to go through the committee process so other uh, stakeholders could come to the table and uh, talk about DEI programs that uh, they that Freedom Caucus members seem to be targeting. And Jeffrey, you've covered a lot of budgets as well, and you've seen uh, this process. It's been a little bit more sedate over the years, especially in the House and in the Senate as well. So I'm wondering if we're going to see uh, anything similar play out in the Senate, or do you think it's going to be kind of business as usual? Uh, do you expect any big changes to the budget in the Senate uh, as they go through it this month? 
Uh, I think what you see is going to be more or less what you get in the Senate. I mean, there could be a couple of surprises. Of course, they have a different priority system than the House does. And I mean, it's like, you know, like when you turn a story in your editor, something's going to have to be changed because there's a Senate and that's what they do. So um, I do think, you know, there's one thing that wasn't in the House budget or any earmarks, those programs that lawmakers get in, maybe to fix their local park or something like that. Those will get added in here on the Senate side. And like I said, there'll be some changes around the edges, but the general framework of it is probably going to stay the same when the Senate Finance Committee goes through it next week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, those provisos, too, that's where a chance where we were seeing with the House Freedom Caucus really trying to, to push some agenda items because those provisos can can lend themselves to that. We've been seeing that process played over the years, too. So any any different provisos maybe you see come out of the Senate that we haven't seen before? There are some conservative uh, senators that will probably try to do some similar things to what the Freedom Caucus did. You know, there will be some, uh, you know, uh, probably some amend the provisos that deal with transgender issues, some provisos that may, there's always usually some kind of debate on abortion that ends up coming in the budget. So I expect those kind of things, although probably not the intensity that you saw in the House. Mm -hmm. Joe, uh, another big thing tangential to the budget was that $1.3 billion Scout Motors incentive package. That's a huge package for that $2 billion investment for Scout Motors that's going to be relocating, uh, creating a new factory here in the Midlands, bringing some 4,000 jobs in the coming years. Uh, your paper did a deep dive on that deal. Uh, tell us about this transformational investment, what folks are saying up there at the State House, and uh, just what's in this incentive package. I think one of the things that's interesting is they talk about how BMW transformed the upstate. It went into uh, Spartanburg County, uh, and it has helped grow that area. Same is expected with the Scout Motors deal here in the Midlands. $1.3 billion is a lot of money. $400 million of that is a straight grant to, to the company to help them with construction costs. The states can help build an interchange off of I-77, you know, put in a railroad bridge uh, as well. Um, those are they're going to help with soil stabilization through a loan uh, because it's going to be a heavy plant that's going to be there. Um, so it, it, it's going to it's supposed to bring 4,000 jobs to the area by 2026, uh, with a huge economic impact uh, for years to come if it comes to fruition. There are some clawbacks in here uh, if Scout doesn't bring um, the jobs that they promised the. The, uh, the company would be responsible for up to $790 million back to the state of South Carolina. But uh, Harry Lightsey, the Commerce Secretary, is confident that we won't have to go down that path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there was a little a little worry from some lawmakers. There was some, you know, a couple little bumps, but nothing that really derailed this incentive package from passing. But a lot of folks were still a little worried about what they saw happen with the Carolina Panthers deal uh, following through, too. So I'm guessing... Uh, that's kind of been smoothed over for the most part. Yeah, you have to put these, you have lessons learned from previous deals, so you have to put these types of uh, clawbacks in there from time to time. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I want to pivot really quick to uh, the latest on abortion legislation. Obviously, when we spoke at the beginning of the session, that was something that was dominating the headlines because we just saw that Supreme Court decision, state Supreme Court decision that overruled the six-week ban in the state. Um, I want to ask you just what we're seeing going through uh, the legislature at this point because it seems like things are kind of just um, at a stalemate right now. What, what are you seeing? What are the bills going on right now? Some have actually uh, even been pretty extreme that have garnered some pretty big headlines too from uh, lawmakers in the House. Well, the current situation is both the House and the Senate passed different versions of abortion bans. I mean, the House is, is a total ban with exceptions for uh, you know rape, incest, and the life of the mother. The Senate is a ban at the detection of cardiac activity, typically called the heartbeat bill, at roughly six weeks. Um, so you have a total ban, you have a six-week ban, and neither side at the moment, at least publicly, appears to be willing to budge. I mean, so, I mean, at some point there should be a conference committee that comes together and they'll see if they can figure out some kind of solution. Um, it's kind of a game of chicken. I mean, there's almost no Republicans that are happy with the current situation where, you know, abortions are allowed up to 20 weeks. It's hard. I don't think there's any clinics that are Few, very, very few abortions are done that late in South Carolina, but nobody's happy with that situation, but they've got to figure out some kind of, uh, you know, compromise on it. Um, there have been some more extreme, you know, bills filed. Anyone in South, any lawmaker can file a bill. There's no bar to it. You just basically put it to paper and turn it in. So the one that garnered a lot of national attention would have treated um, and, uh, you know, would have treated a, a fetus at any stage of development like, uh, like a regular person as far as homicide laws go, which if you 
follow it all the way down his path. It could lead to a woman being charged with murder. And, you know, then, you know, in South Carolina, if you kill a child under the age of, I believe it's 11, you can be prosecuted in a death penalty case. But again, all the Republican leadership on both the Senate and the House, like that bill has absolutely no chance. And even the even some of the more uh, conservative Republicans in the House that typically support a total ban were like, no, we don't support this. So um, there's, you know, on abortion, I think there's got to be some movement somewhere, but it says a game of chicken right now. The Senate says they can't support anything close to a total ban. That says they won't support anything but a total ban. So they'll just have to come together and figure something out. Yeah, Jeffrey, we're pretty much where we were during the off session, right? I mean, like nothing's nothing's changed. Everyone kind of, uh, you know, was blasted that early in the session that we haven't really, they did all that work in the off session. Now we're right kind of back where we started from. Yeah, I mean, basically, yes, exactly. We ended up in the same place we ended up in after all those special sessions and everything in 2022. One thing the Senate bill does do that I think does need to get out there is it would eliminate in 1974, the uh, General Assembly passed a proviso or a por portion of a bill that criminalizes women if they get abortion. It does, it does allow for criminal charges. Uh, the Senate bill that passed actually removes that that clause, which a lot of people have said, if anything comes out of that, that's a very important part of this bill that you can't charge a woman with an abortion in the criminal court. Joe, kind of picking up, uh, picking up on that when we're talking about the state Supreme Court, like uh, Jeffrey was talking about right now, our current law for abortion in the state is 20 weeks. Of course, they don't really happen past around 15 in our state, but still that state Supreme Court decision really ruffled a lot of feathers in the state house uh, to the talk about changing how the judicial selection process goes forward in the state. What's the latest on that? We heard from the governor in several speeches earlier this year about his desire to see that process change. We're one of the few states that actually uh, have lawmakers pick judges on our courts. Uh, was that going to change? What's the latest on that movement? So we haven't seen much uh, 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 introduced on that. There might be something that we'll have to wait till next year. There's been a couple bills that I've noticed uh, that have been filed, one by Harvey Peeler, to change how, to make a slight tweak, I would call it, to the uh, judicial election process. Uh, right now, it's a majority of the 170 lawmakers. Harvey Peeler has a bill that would make it a majority of both chambers. It's a slight tweak, but it gives the Senate a little bit more power. Senator Massey has another bill out there that would uh, require that anyone who's deemed qualified for a judicial position uh, that's uh, be screened out of the Judicial Merit Selection Commission, as opposed to just three, uh, or up to three. Uh, this would give more candidates a, a chance at a race and give more um, uh, more of an opportunity, more of a selection to see who who's out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'd also be pretty difficult to change how it's done right now with the entire General Assembly uh, voting on that, because right now a lot of proposals focus on just the Senate confirming those nominees. So you'd have to get rid of 124 House members who I don't think would go quietly. Yeah, definitely, because with, with, uh, with McMaster's proposal for, for having uh, executive appointment with uh, Senate advice and consent, uh, House members may not want to give up their power or, over this. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, let's stick with criminal justice reforms and look at the uh, House Republican agenda item. A big one, uh, both in the House and the Senate, I should say, is bond reform, especially H. 3532. That would close this revolving door that they keep saying is happening when it comes to catch and release of some of these criminals out there who recommit while they're out on bond. Uh, both chambers are on board with this legislation. Do you see that happening, getting to the governor's desk uh, by the end of May? I think that's if if anything around here is a slam dunk. I think that's probably a slam dunk. I mean, both everybody wants it to happen. You know, it's it's been a big deal to Republicans in both the House, Senate, and the governor. So that seems pretty, you know, pretty sure. the The question is kind of in the details. I don't think uh, the Senate and the governor aren't exactly pleased with the House's idea because it needs a little tweaking. That you know, if they had something where you could get up to five years additional in prison on top of your regular sentence if you committed a crime while out on bond. But then there's some question about, well, if you're not found guilty of the first crime, is that you know constitutionally allowed or, or even or fair or anything like that? So there's some details like that that need to be worked out between the two chambers. But yeah, I think bond reform, if you told me to put money on one thing that would get to the governor's desk before the end of this session, that's the one I put the money on. Yeah, pretty bipartisan. You also saw a lot of pro press conferences with some prosecutors and other folks out there really talking about how big of a problem this is. Not, no real stats behind it. I asked like, Chief Mark Hill if there were any stats behind these, uh, but a lot of those prosecutors were saying, look at the backlogs, look at folks trying to uh, get bond revoked through a judge, and it's just not working. 
Well, and if you're if you're looking ahead and wondering what could be the unforeseen problems for what's being worked on here, part of it probably is that um, you know part of the reason is COVID stopped you know a lot of court hearings. Also, you know people didn't want people in jail during COVID, and South Carolina has you know several counties already have full jails. So if you can't people can't afford bond or bond is revoked, jails are going to fill up. So. Uh, you know, I think there's some people looking at all aspects of the problem, but ultimately, you know, there is more than just we want to keep these people behind bars if they're violent and repeat criminals. You're going to have to find a place to keep them, too. Mm-hmm. Joe, we're talking about additional penalties for folks who commit crimes while out on bond. But then when we talk about hate crimes legislation, which would enhance penalties for people who are convicted of a uh, violent crime uh, with a penalty enhancement, if it's if it's proven that it was done out of hate for a certain immutable class of characteristic of a person, uh, that has not gone anywhere especially after the horrific massacre at Mother Emanuel Amy Church in 2015, in which we saw nine black prisoners killed in a hate-fueled attack. Uh, it, what's going on with that bill right now? It seems like there's been movement. There's a lot of, uh, it got out of the House, but I'm, I'm just wondering where it's going right now in the Senate, uh, because there has been a lot of attention focused on that bill. So yeah, as you said, the bill is, it passed the House again, uh, but it's now back in the hands of the Senate. It was, but it stalled last year, in the last session in the Senate. Now, um, the bill, it would, it would uh, have additional penalties for violent crime against a person based on their race, color, religion, or sex, or gender, or, gender or national origin. Um, South Carolina is one of two states without a hate crimes law, uh, but it did move out of a Senate Judiciary Committee um, uh, yesterday, uh, on Tuesday, at a 15-8 vote. Now it's back in front of the full Senate. It didn't go anywhere. It, it stalled in the Senate last year because uh, some senators had concerns over it, and they were uh, kept their name on it. It just didn't move. So we'll see if there's any more, if they could get it over the over the last hurdle um, uh, this year. Yeah, especially when you look at other bills that are you know kind of over in the Senate right now. We're talking about. Uh, anti-CRT bills, we're talking about transgender affirming care bills, those are all going to probably eventually end up on the Senate calendar. And of course, we know that senators can object to these bills and block them essentially. So I'm just wondering if we see uh, that hate crimes legislation become another bargaining chip when it comes to other bills moving forward. What do you what do you think at this point? It, it might. Uh, we'll, we'll see. I mean, um, we, there's a lot, I, mean, I know we may talk about this later, but I mean, there's a lot of a lot of competing bills out there uh, in the Senate, and this is going to be one of those things they're going to have to negotiate behind the scenes on. Mm-hmm. And Jeffrey, I was just talking about, like we said, the Mother Manual shooting back in 2015. We've seen mass shootings in our state since then and across the country, of course, and most recently that tragic shooting in Nashville at a school this past week that left six dead. Are there any gun reform measures going through the state house at this point, or uh, is that kind of a, uh, a lost cause in a Republican legislature? Uh, gun reform bills? No, unless you count. There is the constitutional carry bill that passed the House that allows anyone who can legally own a firearm to carry it openly. They don't need any training or a permit or anything. Right now in South Carolina, if you have a concealed weapons permit from, you know, if you go through that kind of training, you can openly carry. That's the current open carry law. Um, that bill passed the, the open carry anywhere, anytime. That passed the House. It's in the Senate. Um, I haven't heard much about what might happen, but the Senate kind of the last when they when they passed the the the, the last bill, they didn't say much about it, and then all of a sudden at the very end of the session, it popped up one day and got passed like that. So <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes it, I, I'm I'm not sure where that one is, but it wouldn't surprise me if that gets at least some debate in the Senate before this session's over. Yeah, Jeffrey, can you just talk to that really quickly in terms of the process? You know, I mentioned crossover, which is the last day you want to see bills go over. Uh, just give a quick rundown of what we can start expecting to see over the next couple of weeks as we wind down to signy die. Yeah, we're getting to the point where if you don't have your bill already kind of up in a position where it's through committee, you're going to have some trouble getting it on the floor. Um, there's a deadline April 10th, which you know is a Monday, so essentially it's that Thursday before because of the way the legislature meets. And um, e- each chamber has to pass a bill or you need two thirds vote from the other chamber to be able to put it on the calendar. Typically that was a big deal, but remember the house has a super majority, has a two thirds majority. So if the Senate passes something, it's not as hard as it used to be for the house to get that two thirds and put it on the calendar. But um, ultimately at this point, if your bill isn't getting attention right now, you're probably gonna have to wait till next year. Now this is the first year of a two year session. So all bills stay in whatever place they're at when the legislature adjourns in May. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't believe we're almost uh 
to the end of the session already. But Joe, uh, we have about less than 10 minutes left. I want to talk about a couple other bills too. Uh, we're talking about the Constitution. Um, we've seen several bills being proposed about changing our state's constitution, which would need to be done uh, by voters at the ballot box, including one most recently that would make the Comptroller General an appointed position. Uh, kind of fill us in about that whole backstory there with Comptroller General Richard Ekstrom, uh, who was resigning, and, and that, that drama around that, and then this, this, renowned put, this uh, renewed push, I should say, uh, to get this position appointed. So let me start off with my comments uh, with this. No money is missing. Okay. <laughs> the money just never existed. <laughs> this won't affect budget, uh, the budget or state spending. I want to say that up front. So for the course of 10 years, the Comptroller's Office in an annual financial report, which very few people actually look at uh, in terms of when determining how much to spend or, or even uh, when even putting together a state spending plan, the, the Comptroller inflated or double counted money that went towards colleges and universities. Over a 10-year period, that number inflated to 3.5 billion. They discovered the error, the error, and fixed it uh, last year. But it also had to come with a note in this annual financial report. This angered lawmakers. It angered senators, uh, and the Senate held hearings on this. They had an investigation into it, and it ultimately led to Extrem resigning. Um, there was a move by the House to cut Extrem's salary to a dollar. There was a move to impeach him in the House, and the Senate was going to start a trial to remove him from office for willful neglect of duty. With all of this, now as we have to fill this position, um, Kirkman Finley, a former state rep, is out there as a name to possibly fill the position. It's, he's got a lot of votes in the House, uh, and even some in the Senate, apparently. And some Senate members uh, are trying to push for a longtime budget staffer by the name of Mike Sheely who works in the Department of Administration now, but he knows the state budget, he knows government accounting. Um, this is, uh, we have, this is a, right now it's a elected position every four years. Lawmakers wanna make this an appointed position, part of the governor's cabinet, which could give the governor more control and more oversight over this particular office. McMaster, Governor McMaster has said he would like to see someone who's a non political type in this position with finance or accounting experience. But right now, the General Assembly gets to pick who fills this position, who finishes Ekstrom's term. But that will require a joint assembly between the Senate and the House. And we'll see if they agree, knowing where the votes are for Finley. We'll see if the Senate actually agrees to a joint assembly. Um, or if we may have to go another route to see how this job may be filled. And then Jeffrey, I want to talk to you really quickly about the, another constitutional amendment that would ask voters if they would support eliminating the prohibition against the state or its political subdivisions from providing direct aid to religious or other private educational institutions. This is a bill that's also in tandem with a house pass bill that is uh, a big step towards uh, voucher schools that was passed in the Senate. Uh, can you kind of just fill us in there on the, on the education front, what's happening in the state house this year? There is, I mean, you know, we came very, very close to having a voucher-like bill pass last session. I mean, it got through both the House and Senate. You know, they had a conference committee trying to work out their differences, and it fell apart right at the very, very end of the, of the session. And, I mean, um, it's something that seems to have a broad amount of support among Republicans and is even getting some Democrats on board at this point. Um, the question is in the details. I mean, I think that um, we're going to end up in the same place we did before. The House has passed its version. The Senate's going to have its own ideas. And then can they come together? I mean, some of the key places is, you know, the House tends to want to make this into a uh, pilot program where the Senate wants to go ahead and pass it where they don't have to renew it again in the future. Um, there's some differences on how much money is given to the, the program and, 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 and also participation levels, um, you know, whether it's just kept to um, poor families and maybe some special needs students, or is it broader acceptance? Um, in the end, I su expect that probably the Senate's thoughts are going to win the day. You know, it'll probably be a broader program. It'll probably provide a little more money, probably won't have to be renewed. But again, they're, like I said, I thought they had it all together last year and they didn't quite get together. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe, with less than a minute left, I want to ask you about medical marijuana. It seems like it hit a snag this year. That's uh, the P4 Republican Senator Tom Davis's bill. Uh, tell us what's going on with that and, and its future this session. So the Senate tried to put it, <clears throat> set it for special order, which would give it top priority to be considered. That special order vote failed 20 to 20. 
couldn't get a, a majority of the Senate to, to agree to it, at least a majority of those voting. This is even after the Senate passed it last year. Um, so Senator Davis voiced his frustration on the Senate floor. Um, it was very emotional. He said he had been working and building up capital with his fellow lawmakers, and it just didn't go anywhere. And the idea that the bill has not been vetted, he said, is wrong. It's, this bill has gone through eight years of vetting. Um, is Davis's position on that. But right now, it looks like the, the legislation may be stuck again for one more year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot going on there. We have a couple more weeks left in session. Like we said, that's got to get over before crossover too. Um, we'll be watching with you guys at State House Reporters, Jeffrey Collins with the Associated Press and Joe Bustos with the State Newspaper. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Gavin. To stay up to date with the latest news throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that I host on Tuesdays and Saturdays that you can find on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org or wherever you find podcasts. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.